to the fourth presentation in the Dental Neuralgia Association Inc.'s 2020 webinar series. The series will continue next year with leading experts in the field, but more about that later. The topic for this evening is non-operative interventions. With us to speak about some of those interventions is Dr. Allison Trikande. Uh, before we begin Dr. Shrikande's presentation, we have a few suggestions to improve your experience. It's best to connect via computer to be able to view the PowerPoint presentation. If you've joined by phone and want to switch to a computer, you should exit the meeting and then rejoin. All microphones will be muted during the presentation. The use of earphones is recommended to reduce feedback. The meeting will be recorded. Dr. Shikande's presentation will be approximately 30 minutes. And to the extent that time permits, a question and answer session will follow. Questions may be emailed to pedendalassociation at gmail.com anytime during the presentation, or by raising your hand, and I'll explain what that means, or typing the question on the chat box. To raise your hand, click on the participants list at the bottom of your screen. Choose your name from the list on the hand icon, and then you can enter your question. To use the chat function, click on the chat icon on the bottom of your screen and type your question. Now, Dr. Allison Augusta Srikande is a board certified physical medicine and rehabilitation specialist. She's chair of the Medical Education Committee for the International Pelvic Pain Society. She's published peer review articles on the treatment of muscle and nerve pain in academic journals, presented original work regarding her unique treatment protocol at multiple professional medical society meetings and is a recognized speaker at multiple medical institutions, grand rounds and medical meetings. Formerly affiliated with the Weill Cornell, Dr. Shikande helped to start the Weill Cornell Medical Center Women's Health Musculoskeletal Outpatient Clinic. She's the founder of the Pelvic Rehabilitation Medicine with numerous sites across the country taking care of men and women with pelvic pain and pelvic floor muscle dysfunction. She received her training at the Royal College of Surgeons, Ireland Medical School, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, Harvard Medical School, New York University Lango Medical Center, Rusk Institute. Before we begin, let me remind you that this presentation contains general information about medical conditions and treatments. Information is offered for support and educational purposes and should not replace professional medical advice. Viewers should consult a doctor or other appropriate healthcare provider. Please remember that a response to a question is not intended and should not be taken as medical advice. Medical advice can be given only after a complete review of a patient's medical history and examination and the receipt of any applicable test results. With that said, I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Shritande. Thank you so much, David. I'm very excited to be here uh, speaking uh, to the Pudendal Neuralgia Association and on behalf of Pelvic Rehabilitation Medicine. So today, uh, I was asked to speak about the non-operative treatment options for pudendal neuralgia. No disclosures. So the objective of today's talk will be to talk about the pathophysiology of pudendal neuralgia, uh, specifically in the setting of chronic pelvic pain syndrome the unique physiatry approach to this problem and several non-operative treatment options. So this is something we call nonce criteria. This is the criteria for pudendal nerve entrapment. 
um, which is rare. So less than 1% of the patients we see uh, with pudendal neuralgia actually have entrapment. But this is not this criteria is a, a guideline uh, really uh, to help us if we're concerned for what we call PNE or pudendal nerve entrapment. So overall, it's pain in the territory of the pudendal nerve running from the anus to the penis or the clitoris. Pain predominantly experienced while sitting. Pain that does not wake the patient at night. Uh, the pain with no objective sensory impairments and pain that is relieved by a diagnostic pudendal nerve block. So associated symptoms of pudendal neuralgia. So classically, it is nerve pain. Nerve pain can be burning in nature. It can be itchy. Uh, you can have sensation of lightning rods, or quite often we hear patients say they have a sensation of a foreign body in their rectum or vagina. There can be some tingling or numbness in the distribution of the pudendal nerve. Practically, the pain is worse with sitting, which does make sense as the pudendal nerve wraps around what we call the ischial tuberosity uh, uh, or your sit bones. So when you're sitting, um, you are really pressing on that nerve and it's challenging for the nerve to get a lot of blood flow while sitting. Uh, classically, there's uh, pain with bowel movement when there's pudendal neuralgia. So it can be associated urinary urgency and frequency. So this can mimic uh, IC or interstitial cystitis. It can be pain with intercourse. And some patients present with uh, what we call persistent genital arousal, where um, there, it's an unwanted persistent uh, arousal uh, symptom, uh, which can also be associated with dysfunctional uh, pudendal nerve. So the causes of pudendal neuralgia um, are, uh, there are multiple. In the world of entrapment, where the nerve is actually entrapped, um, the most common areas where the nerve can be entrapped are either between the sacrospinous and sacrotuberous ligaments at the posterior pelvis or at Alcox Canal. Uh, things that can predispose to entrapment are a history of abdominal or pelvic surgeries where they have scar tissue or adhesions. Um, a history of pregnancy can do this as well, or, or thickening of the sacrospinous and sacrotuberous ligaments. If they're thick and the space between the two is small, it, it can entrap the pudendal nerve. Uh, another uh, way pudendal neuralgia can present is what we call a stretch neuropathy, where the nerve itself, uh, we describe it almost as um, it's a, a pendulum, again, that runs under the sit bones that this nerve can be stretched. And when it's stretched, um, it can present also as pudendal neuralgia. This can happen in pregnancy. It can happen after a spontaneous vaginal delivery. And it can happen if patients are in what we call the prolonged dorsal lithotomy position. So their, their hips are flexed and what we call externally rotated during a, spe a specific surgery, a hip surgery or um, any sort of urogyne pelvic surgery. If you're in this for a long period of time, it can stretch the nerve. Lastly, there's the ischemic neuropathy, which is the most common. This can also happen during pregnancy. Uh, this can happen most commonly, what we call is myofascial ischemia, secondary, secondary to a hypertonic or spastic pelvic floor, where it really just squeezes that pudendal nerve over a long period of time. And in, in endometriosis, you can have direct innervation um, of the pudendal nerve, as well as uh, release of pro-inflammatory cytokines around the nerve, which can irritate and cause pudendal uh, neuralgia. So this is a picture of uh, what can happen during a vaginal delivery. You can see the, ba the baby's head is putting a lot of pressure on the pudendal canal contents here. And this is where the pudendal nerve lies. So you can imagine how uh, stretched neuropathy can occur from a vaginal delivery. It also puts some pressure on the pelvic floor musculature, the levator ani muscles itself, which can also secondarily uh, compress the nerve if they become dysfunctional postpartum. This is some anatomy uh, looking up into the pelvis. We'll start with the pudendal nerve. So the pudendal nerve here is Alcox Canal. And, and then from Alcox Canal, 
it breaks off into multiple branches. You have the inferior rectal branch going to the rectum here. You have what we call the perineal branch going to the perineum. And then you have this dorsal nerve to the clitoris, which climbs up underneath the pubic symphysis here. You also have another nerve next to it. This is the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. And then you have multiple muscles here in the levator ani sling going from the pubic symphysis to the coccyx. That's the female anatomy. Now we look at the male anatomy, which is very similar, uh, where you have Alcox canal here and you have multiple branches, similar branches. You have the inferior rectal branch going to the rectum. You have the perineal branch going to the perineum. And then here you have the dorsal nerve to the penis instead of the clitoris for the men. So you can see how the nerves are in yellow in the anatomy. You can see how the nerves in yellow flow with the arteries in red and the veins in blue. So you can see that the requirement for the yellow nerves to have the red arteries uh, provide the blood flow uh, to keep the nerves happy. So they, they really do flow together for a reason because the, the pudendal nerve really requires the blood flow, essentially. A little more anatomy. Um, looking at this picture, you, you have the pudendal nerve, what we call the most medial, so closest to the rectum or the coccyx. And then next to the pudendal nerve, you have this posterior femoral cutaneous nerve, and then even further out laterally, you have the sciatic nerve. You can see the, the close proximity between the different nerves, and there is uh, some overlap. And you can see how the pudendal nerve comes underneath the, these thick ligaments here. These are, see the sacrospinous and sacrotuberous ligaments, which we had talked about earlier. Here you have the sacrospinous behind and the sacrotuberous on top. So you can imagine if there is some thickening of these ligaments, that the pudendal nerve could be compressed when trying to pass through these two ligaments. And in addition to the ligaments here, this is a nice picture of other than the levator ani sling, so the pelvic floor sling, the other muscles that we we concentrate on treating are the external rotators of the hip because they can also irritate the nerve. So here you have the piriformis, you have your obturator internus and your quadratus femoris here all crossing uh, from uh, here to here and you can see the connection with, with the nerves. So this is looking at the innervation again looking up into the pelvis but really how the pudendal nerve here as we described inferior rectal perineal and dorsal nerve the clitoris um, how it really relates to the other peripheral nerves of the pelvis. And you can really see the crossover, particularly with the pudendal nerve, with the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve, other, otherwise known as the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh. You can see how that innervation, there's quite a bit of crossover. And it is important when uh, diagnosing and treating people to really delineate the different nerve involvement in patient's symptoms and pain. And uh, quite often something called a Q-tip test can really help physicians do that, where we take a nice uh, a soft cotton swab and we put it along the vulva and we, we see if there's any sensitivity or pain with the, with the cotton swab. And we're trying to see where that sensitivity or pain is located. If it's in the bottom two thirds of the vulva, then we are really looking at the pudendal nerve and if it's in the upper two thirds, it's a, it's a combination of the ilioinguinal nerve and the genital branch of the genital femoral. So, well, so how do physiatrists look at pudendal neuralgia and pelvic pain? So physiatrists are uh, rehab docs. So we are A, looking to rehabilitate the muscles and the nerves. So we focus on muscles, nerves, and joints classically, and we, we take a non-operative approach. And um, a couple of things that are different is that we are really uh, uh, detectives and constantly trying to find the primary pain generator and the underlying cause of why that pudendal nerve is irritated. Um, so we're really trying to find uh, is it, what is the underlying cause, and we're trying to treat it in a, in a non-operative uh, fashion. So these are the mechanical changes that we see and treat with pudendal neuralgia and pelvic pain. Um, quite often, there is a concomitant uh, muscle spasm component of the pelvic floor and the external rotators of the hip. 
And this can, as we discussed, uh, really squeeze the nerves and decrease the local blood flow. And we discussed how the blood flow keeps the nerve happy. And this will change the local pH of the environment and stimulate these pro-inflammatory cytokines around the pedendal nerve. And that can contribute to the pedendal neuralgia. And also, uh, pedendal nerve is a peripheral nerve, so it's present for a long period of time. Patients also get upregulation of their central sensitization. And then we also look at the weakness that occurs in these muscles that are in spasm. They're short, spastic, and weak. And when that happens, there's some compensatory changes that can lead to mechanical changes in the hip joints, the sacroiliac joint, lumbar sacral spine, and pubic symphysis. So we are really looking at the entire picture of a patient. And now this is how a physiatrist would gauge their, their progress, really, uh, with patients with pudendal neuralgia. So other than pain, the, the vast scale, we really focus on asking patients about their function um, with their bladder, urgency, frequency, with their bowels, pain with bowel movement, constipation that can occur with chronic uh, pudendal neuralgia and pelvic floor muscle dysfunction, um, intercourse, their ability to have intercourse and pain-free intercourse. We really focus on their ability to exercise, to walk, to run, to lift. Their ability to sit, go to work and sit is, is, is something that we're judging our progress on with pudendal neuralgia patients, um, as well as their ability to sleep restfully through the night. So this is when we see a patient at first, we ask them these questions, and then post our treatment protocol, we're again asking these questions to really see our, our patient's improvement in, in their quality of life and their function. Describes the neurogenic inflammation or peripheral sensitization that quite often comes along with pudendal neuralgia. So essentially, the nerve is is um, is functioning. It's just it's swimming in what we call a pro-inflammatory soup. So these are all pro-inflammatory cytokines: substance P, neurokinin A, bradykinin, prostaglandins. It's this mast cell degradation of histamine. All these things surround the nerve, and they cause that pudendal nerve to just fire inappropriately. We call it aberrant firing of the nerve. So it, it starts to cause pain or hyperarousal, um, and it's essentially, um, it's firing when it should not. So this is a nice picture of this. And this describes the chronic nature of when the nerve is swimming in this pro-inflammatory soup. Really, there are real changes at the uh, messenger RNA level in what we call the dorsal root ganglion from these pro-inflammatory mediators that cause this nerve to be hyper-excitable peripherally and eventually centrally as well, because the peripheral nerves always talk to the brain through the spinal cord. So it, it is all connected, so it's important to really treat it all. This is our three-prong approach to really healing the pelvic, uh, the pudendal nerve. Essentially, we believe that it is important to treat not only the peripheral sensitization or the neurogenic inflammation around the pudendal nerve, but in addition, we believe it's important to also treat the concomitant myofascial pain and dysfunction around the nerve, right? So the muscles and the fascial restriction stop kind of squeezing that nerve and leading to what we call a neural ischemia. And in addition, we feel it's important to treat that central sensitization, that process where the pudendal nerve talking to the so the brain really will upregulate the central nervous system. So we, we take this approach for patients and we really treat it all at the same time. So what is our treatment algorithm for pudendal neuralgia at pelvic rehabilitation medicine? So what we do is we first, uh, we work as physiatrists, we are extensions of pelvic floor physical therapy. Um, so we work closely with uh, pelvic floor physical therapists who really are um, experts in um, pelvic floor dysfunction and pudendal neuralgia. Um, so we would ask our pelvic floor physical therapists to do um, internal uh, mobilization of the pelvic floor musculature to release any concomitant spasm, as well as um, uh, soft tissue mobilization. Quite often, there, we ask them to do nerve gliding on our patients, conceptually trying to do the same thing that our protocol does and that we're trying to just create space and increase blood flow to the nerve, right, so that it essentially it can heal itself. Sometimes we'll ask uh, for TENS units as well, um, as well as some uh, 
connective tissue is important and sometimes uh, trigger point release and heat and cold therapy. In addition, quite often we're asking patients with pudendal neuralgia to get a cushion because we were doing all this work really to, again, to heal that pudendal nerve and increase blood flow and create, create space that we really want um, when patients are sitting to protect all the work we're doing on the nerve. So the different cushions, we some patients like cushion your assets, other, others like what we call Theraceat. Conceptually, they're all trying to not put too much pressure or neural ischemia on the pudendal nerve as it wraps around the ischial tuberosity or, or sit bone. A lot of lifestyle modifications are discussed, uh, and we we really discuss um, exercise. What one, what certain exercises are, are are helpful? We do try to keep our patients moving. I mean, classically, uh, biking can irritate the pudendal nerve, so sometimes we'll ask patients to stop spinning or biking. Um, but we really ask patients what they like to do, and we'll we'll make an exercise program. Uh, there are specific yoga programs, uh, particularly Your Pace Yoga by Dusty and Miller, which is excellent at really creating space around the pudendal nerve. So quite often we'll work that in and um, talk a lot about deep breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, um, some um, meditation if needed to really calm down, again, that central nervous system. These are some of the tools that some patients use, uh, particularly our, our uh, female patients. Um, which can help. There's these are dilators and wands, which can really just help release any myofascial spasm around the pudendal nerve. So it is important to take an integrative and holistic approach um, to pudendal neuralgia and pelvic pain. And there has been a significant amount of data on using uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, as well as acupuncture, yoga, um, and uh, nutrition particularly, and then also the, the protocol that we do at Pelvic Rehabilitation Medicine where we do external ultrasound guided uh, hydrodissection nerve blocks and trigger points is more of a functional restorative approach where we're really um, not trying to make patients feel better for you know for an hour, but really trying to reset, retrain, and make a better environment for the nerve to heal itself. So this is the paper that we recently published um, myself and uh, several other physicians on just looking at uh, the whole picture with patients and taking an integrative approach. So electrical stimulation of the pudendal nerve is something that we uh, do suggest where uh, it's basically a home's TENS unit, we call it. And classically, we'll ask that the patients get it from their public floor physical therapist. And we usually have patients put it at their medial buttocks, right where the pudendal nerve crosses with alcox canal. And the TENS unit concept is really the gate control theory of pain. We're really trying to stop that peripheral nerve, the pudendal nerve, talking to the, to the brain. So calming down, again, that central sensitization and upregulation of your entire nervous system that can happen when your pudendal nerve is firing inappropriately. So there has been some uh, data on uh, treating the pudendal nerve with the TENS unit um, at this point, mostly in, in rat models. So the pelvic rehabilitation medicine protocol to treat the pudendal nerve. Um, so I, as mentioned uh, briefly, we work with pelvic floor physical therapists where they see pelvic, P, pelvic floor PT once a week and they would see us once a week. And conceptually what we're doing is external ultrasound guided trigger point injections to the different uh, muscles of the pelvic floor, the levator ani sling, so just one muscle at a time, as well as ultrasound-guided uh, peripheral nerve hydrodissection blocks, where it's high-volume blocks where we're conceptually trying to create space um, for the middle nerve to then heal itself. It's once a week for six weeks, and we do three on each side, so three, three on the right and three on the left. And the pathophysiology of this treatment is altered response of the sodium channels on the primary afferent nerve fibers with this repeated anesthetic exposure. So the repeated lidocaine exposure essentially calms down this hyperactive nerve. In addition, with the high volume technique, the lysis of these tight connective tissue bands that can surround the nerve fibers and really not allow the nerve fiber to move freely or get the blood flow it needs. 
Lastly, we're, we're by increasing blood flow and de de decreasing inflammation, we're trying to deplete that inflammatory soup that exists. So we're trying to deplete the substance P, the histamine, and other pro-inflammatory neuropeptides around the pudendal nerve. So the goal of the nerve block is in combination with the trigger point injection series, these are the four real goals of what we're trying to do. Um, is to retrain your central and peripheral nervous system. I always tell patients it's almost like you're an iPhone and I'm trying to re reboot you. I'm turning you off and on because at, at this point, we just need to reset how your muscles and nerves are functioning and then not only functioning, how they're talking to one another. We're trying to decrease neurogenic inflammation that exists around the pudendal nerve. We're trying to create space and improve blood flow to the pudendal nerve. And lastly, once that's done, we call that the down training. One, two, and three is called down training. We work with the pelvic floor physical therapist to start to lengthen and strengthen your pelvic floor musculature, as well as the, particularly the hip abductors, um, in combination with the neuromuscular reeducation program to get the support for the organs that's necessary, as well as the hips and the lumbar sacral spine. It's an important area, um, so we really work on on uh, getting it strong once once it's ready. So this is some of the uh, papers that my colleagues and I at Public Rehabilitation Medicine have published. Um, this particular paper is looking at our protocol, the PRM protocol with, uh, with post endometriosis excision uh, uh, patients who have persistent pudendal neuralgia and pelvic pain, um, and it's showing um, that, that it was effective in treating particularly uh, pain with intercourse, patient's ability to sit and, for long periods of time and work, and patient's ability to sleep, as well as their overall VAS. This was another recent paper. Um, again, this looked at all chronic pelvic pain. It was 73 females um, with the pudendal neuralgia and chronic pelvic pain syndrome where the pudendal nerve was affected. Uh, treated with our injection protocol and pelvic floor physical therapy um, and showing that uh, really, again, statistically significant for decreasing their VAS, so their pain scale, as well as the function remains to be um, intercourse, ability to sit, and ability to sleep. And this one is looking at treating men with chronic pelvic pain syndrome. So again, underneath the umbrella, chronic pelvic pain syndrome really involves the pudendal nerve as well as the pelvic floor musculature um, on both sides. So we call it bilaterally. So this is males with uh, chronic pelvic pain syndrome with, again, our protocol showing that we're able to uh, decrease their, their vast, their ability to keep sitting and working as well as their decrease their urinary symptoms for the men of urgency, frequency, and burning with urination. This is a newer option um, we recently published on this. This is what we do for patients who are more in the realm of uh, re refractory to, to treatment, uh, looking for a non-operative treatment option, or really, um, with our protocol, got, say, 80% 80, 80 better, but looking for that extra 20% bump. What it is is alpha-2 microglobulin is in the realm of regenerative medicine, where we draw a patient's blood, and then we centrifuge it down to the A2M, or alpha-2 microglobulin, which is uh, the largest non-immunoglobulin protein in your blood. So what it is, it's a protease inhibitor. I would think of it, it's, it's like a Pac-Man, essentially, that binds to that those pro-inflammatory cytokines we discussed, so that inflammatory soup, it binds to that, and then it's a carrier protein, so it pull, uh, pulls it out of your body. So it's really a natural natural steroid, essentially. Um, it's soothing. It's not it's not in any way gonna, going to cause any, any flare. It's more of a soothing uh, anti-inflammatory uh, protein that comes from your blood. But we put it in the same place as we do the rest of our protocol. It's just we're putting A2M rather than using lidocaine or lidocaine and normal saline or lidocaine and a little dexa methadone. This is our recent paper published about uh, using alpha-2 macroglobulin for uh, around the pudendal nerve for chronic pelvic pain patients. 
um, really showing a, a decrease in BAS and a, a, an improvement in their ability, patient's ability to sit, as well as ability to exercise and um, have uh, and decrease any pain with intercourse. Overall, with pudendal neuralgia and chronic pelvic pain, it, it really is important to address uh, wellness and a, a healthy lifestyle, talk a lot about mental health, exercise, um, as well as um, keeping you know, motivated, keeping up with really uh, your pelvic core exercises or yoga and whatever really uh, works for you. Nutrition is also something we talk quite a bit about, it's particularly if there's concomitant constipation, pain with bowel movement, we quite often will add magnesium citrate to patients so that they're not straining during having a bowel movement or psyllium husk. We talk a lot about increasing patients' water intake, which is great for their bowel and bladder. Even if they have urinary urgency where they're peeing a lot, we really ask patients to drink a lot of water. Um, we talk about the bladder diet or IC diets for patients with pudendal neuralgia. Quite often, as we said, it can mimic IC. So we're talking a lot about decreasing caffeine, decreasing alcohol intake, um, seeing if acidic foods can bother, bother you. Sometimes they do, such as um, lemons can bother some of our patients. And overall, an anti-inflammatory diet approach is what we take for pelvic pain and pudendal neuralgia. So in summary, uh, pudendal neuralgia arises from uh, multiple pathologies. Direct compression of the pudendal nerve, uh, pelvic floor muscle spasm com compressing the pudendal nerve, and peripheral and central sensitization. An interdisciplinary multimodal approach is essential for this patient population. Treatment approach with selective pudendal nerve branch desensitization combined with trigger point injections and pelvic floor physical therapy all together can provide long lasting relief in a non operative fashion for pudendal neuralgia patients. Thank you, Dr. Fakande. Um, we've had two questions, and I think the first one's been answered over the last half hour, but I'll see if you want to add anything. Sure. Uh, one of our viewers has asked, is there a valid hope for a safe treatment to cure pudendal neuralgia, entrapment, or any other cause, or even a way to decrease the relentless pain of, of it so I can go off or decrease opioids. Uh, sounds like the last at least 10 or 15 minutes you've been going through some of those. Is there anything you'd like to add? Yes. Um, first of all, yes, there is hope, uh, definitely. I mean, this is what we see in trees. Uh, most, most of our clinics, we focus a lot on the pudendal nerve. So there is definitely hope. I think the main th uh, issue is to really discuss with, with your physician about getting a proper diagnosis as to why. Uh, I think that that is the challenge, is really trying not to miss any underlying contributing factors to why the, you have pudendal neuralgia, right? Um, examples, sometimes for women, there may be underlying gynecological issues that can be treated. Uh, such as either endometriosis or fibroids or adenomyosis that could be causing a secondary spasm on the pudendal nerve for many reasons. Uh, for, um, in, in addition, particularly for our men, sometimes there is a concomitant uh, hip pathology uh, that when, when you have hip pathology, we call it a uh, labral tear with, a, with either a bony impingement. You can have pudendal neuralgia that comes with that because for two reasons. One, your body's looking to stabilize your hip because your mechanics are off, so it squeezes those external rotators around the hip, which squeezes the nerve, the pudendal nerve. And then in addition, when you have hip pathology, um, the way your hip moves in that ball and socket motion, it's not a perfect pendulum quite often as it should be. And so when the pendulum's off to the left or to the right, it can shear the pudendal nerve, particularly with activity. So that is another reason that you may be having this pudendal neuralgia. Um, is there a hernia somewhere in the uh, inguinal region or 
the femoral region or obturator hernias, all these can put can irritate the pudendal nerve. Um, there are there are just so many different reasons, and that is why a pelvic rehabilitation medicine really that's all we do all day because it is a complicated area. But I think the, the key is not just to get it blindly treated, honestly, but you need a physician who really deeply under, under, understands the disease process and can give you uh, an answer as to why your nerve is behaving as it is. You know, that, that's, that's the key. Okay, thank you. The other question is, what is the longest active nerve block medication? I guess that's longest acting nerve block medication. Yeah, rupivacaine or bupivacaine are the, are the two longest ones. I don't think that's the key. My, and from my opinion, I, as I mentioned before, it's not really, you know, the ones we do are the benefit of what our, our protocol um, is very different um, in that most of it's mechanical. It's, it's really that high volume technique and where you're placing it. Uh, and that it's not really blocking it for an extra half hour, or even multiple hours is not the secret sauce. It's more creating that space and just you have to create an environment where the nerve has blood flow, is not inflamed, and can heal itself. That's it will heal. It just it needs to be in a better environment. So blocking it for a couple extra hours is not going to do that. So it's not really the the medication uh, longer acting, so to speak, that makes a difference. So the, the pain is a symptom of a, of a different problem, and the solution is to solve the problem um, and protect the nerve and yep. worry so much about the symptom. Exactly. Exactly right. Okay. Somebody has requested that you stop sharing the PowerPoint screen. I don't know if that's easy to do or not. Okay. The next question are there any pelvic pain clinics around the U.S. other than in New York? This person cannot seem to find any doctors in her area that know anything about pudendal neuralgia. I sympathize with her there. And uh, including pelvic floor therapists. Is there a list of medical professionals in the U.S. that know anything about this? Well, I mean, if you look at our website, Pelvic Rehabilitation Medicine, we we are in New York City, we're in New Jersey, Long Island. We are in outside of uh, Detroit, we're in Birmingham, Michigan, and we're in Washington, DC. We are in Miami, Florida, we're in Dallas, uh, Texas, Houston, Texas. We're in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, we're in Chicago, Illinois. Um, so we are uh, pretty accessible to a lot of people. So I would recommend checking our website and seeing one of our, our physicians who all we do all day is specialize in the pelvis and the pudendal nerve. Um, so that is one place I would recommend starting with us. Uh, we would love to see you. Another option, if that if those cities are not feasible for, for you to, to get to, um, uh, the International Pelvic Pain Society, uh, ha which I'm involved with, has a, a great website. Uh, if you go to their website, you can, you can, there's a drop down that says find a provider. So if you do that, you can try to find a provider in your local area. So those are really the two best resources. And then the last resource I think is the Pudendal Neuralgia Association um, is a fantastic resource. So those are, those, those would be the best three. So yeah, but if you're able to get to us in one of our cities, we are happy to see you. Okay, and I think also that on the Pudendal Neuralgia Association's website, we have a link to the IPPS website with the list of uh, physicians. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't see any more questions, so I'd like to thank you for taking the time to share your knowledge with us, and thanks to our viewers for tuning in. Please monitor our website for information regarding the 2021 webinar series. Also, you can now obtain a DVD of our patient conference by visiting our website, pedendalassociation.org. Thank you, everybody, for your participation, and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, David.